um, other Alis who might have missed it and find the questions that we're going to begin with. All right, so um, let me make sure that this is regenerating. All right, so maybe we, let's kick off um, by going through each of the panel and maybe you could tell us a little bit about how your job has changed um, over the last 12 months. Where were you 12 months ago and where are you now in your career? Do you want to go first, Melanie? Sure. So 12 months ago, I was working at Macquarie Uni, um, actually in health economics, but probably a 100 metre walk away from Belinda's office. Um, and it's also worth noting that one year ago, I did not have a colleague who was an expert in R who also had a beautiful Indian ringnet parrot. And now I do. So, <laughs> so our ladies. Things are better. Yeah, she's like the top R uh, person who I've met and she also has an Indian ring neck, so there must be a thing. <laughs> um, I, I was in academia for 18 years and I got uh, a Macquarie Uni Research Fellowship and a DECRA and blah, blah, blah. And when it was time to get a faculty position, I was offered and turned down a job in Perth because um, I've got a mortgage and two children and grandparents that take care of the kids. And so I, last November, I decided to move and I applied for academic jobs and industry jobs. And unsurprisingly, there were more <laughs> industry jobs than academic jobs. So I was offered an industry one. I work at one of the big four banks and I help with um, customer user experience. And I'm really, really rubbish at R, but I have transitioned to, you know, so. <laughs> nice. Um, Zoe. You're next on my screen. You may not be next on okay. people's screens, but do you want to go next? Yeah. Um, so 12 months ago, I was at the US Study Center where I worked on, well, I was doing um, research assistance work and that was 50% of my role and the other half was doing data visualization work. Um, if you don't know, the US Study Center is a I guess a research center or a think tank attached to the University of Sydney that focuses on US society. Um, and they have a particular focus on American politics in particular. Um, and the research we do in American politics is fairly quantitative. Um, the CEO of the US Study Center, Simon Jackman, was prior to taking up that role, a professor of political science and statistics at Stanford. Um, so he had a very strong statistical background. And after I finished uni, after I finished my undergrad degree, I was very interested in kind of exploring the intersection of political science and statistics. Um, and so I moved to Sydney, started that job. And along the way, it turned into more data visualization work than academic research. Um, and, you know, about a year ago, I was thinking, well, my options are do a PhD or go into industry. And, you know, if you don't like industry, you can always go back into academia and get a PhD. Um, so about a month ago, I decided to leave and I joined Canva. Um, at Canva, I do a lot of um, descriptive statistics. My team also does um, experiments with our, um, like the different groups we have within the company run experiments, um, analyzing why, for example, users might use a certain feature on the website. Um, so we're in charge of experiments and descriptive statistics. There's also a data science team that does a lot of machine learning. Cool. Awesome. Um, Sarah, you're next on my going left to right on my screen. Sure. Uh, so hi, I'm Sarah. Um, this time last year, I had pretty much just submitted my PhD. 
Um, <laughs> time has flown since then. <laughs> um, and my PhD uh, was with John, who's also on this call. Um, and Steph, I've still got your key ring, which says not another doctor, and I have it with me every day, and I love it. Um, well, not that kind of doctor, yeah. Um, Almost exactly this time last year that I dragged you into PwC to be interviewed. Mm -hmm. I literally no, it was dragged like, her in here this you're, time. It was like in April last year. It's been so fast. Oh, well, it's been even longer. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, <laughs> I forced her. I shanghaied her in Um... And my PhD is mainly in statistical machine learning. Um, so there's a lot of um, mixture of writing, uh, figuring up algorithms by hand and then coding them up in R. So very R heavy based, building R packages. Um, and then in February this year, I started at BCG Gamma, um, which is the advanced analytics arm of the Boston Consulting Group. Um, and it's very different. Um, so my work, uh, changes from client to client. Um, so I've been on a, a banking case, I've been on um, a supply chain simulation case, um, I've been on a case looking at customer churn. Um, and I guess the common theme throughout all of them is that very fast paced, value focused, very interesting, and unfortunately not as much R as I'd like. So uh, I'm kind of <laughs> become a bit more of a Python expert. Um, I do quite actually, <laughs> it's a bit like heresy, but I do quite enjoy it, um, coding in Python. Um, but it's, it makes me re realize the benefits of R. Um, but mm -hmm. like there are nice things about Python as well, which R can't do as well. So yeah, nice. that's my awesome. life now. <laughs> How about you, Steph? Um, yeah, so I, a year ago, I was working for PwC um, in advanced analytics. <laughs> I just finished up with a major client um, standing up a machine learning team with them uh, for nine months and I was moving on to the responsible AI beat, uh, which I was a developer for and doing a lot of work on that, pwc.com slash RAI. I said that a few times. Um, I was also working on um, data strategy. And I have a bird on my head, uh, an analytics strategy as well, helping clients use the data they've got and strategize their way to, you know, how they're going to do analytics. These days, I'm back, um, back where I really began, actually. So my title is Principal Econometrician over at Transurban, but in reality, I'm the predictive analytics lead um, for the traffic and strategy group. So I continue on with my... Um, with my machine learning focus and AI and stuff where necessary. But my primary focus is supporting Transurban um, with the future, effectively. Now, transport is an area where econometrics is particularly um, important because if we look at machine learning, one of the things we get out of machine learning is highly accurate predictions. But we don't always have appropriate inference around the weights that go into those predictions. Whereas, you know, a statistical or econometric approach may give, give us weights and elasticities that we can rely on in the sense that we have an asymptotic or finite distribution to make inference on. And that's quite important to us in what we do. So my PhD was in that field and now I'm doing it again. Um, so it's been really fun. I'm back where I started working a lot in macroeconomics um, and that sort of thing after spending many, many years as a generalist. We've got a small team, uh, part of a larger team, uh, which again, like consulting is not that different, but let me tell you the pace, the pace is glorious. <laughs> Sarah, you've been working a lot of late nights lately, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I am working a lot less late nights at the moment, which was probably a big reason for my move. Um, Sarah knows that partner that I work for, um, you, you met Al a few times, he, he's very good to me. Um, but single mum, three kids in the middle of COVID, that, that was the real factor in the decision there. Yeah, yeah. Um, that Steph, leads to so... Oh, go Melanie. Sorry. Are the good hours, um, are you working for state government? Um, so Transurban is an ASX20 company. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, not so private consulting or okay what who do we work for so, good hours is the question <laughs> um yeah so the next question the first the top 
voted question on the Slido. So those of you who are arriving late, if you go to slido.com, use the event Our Ladies underscore Sydney. There's a whole list of questions. Um, definitely add more questions to the list and vote for those that you want me to ask. The top voted question right now is about work-life balance, right? So that's a really nice segue. Thank you, Steph. Um, so who do we work for in order to get work-life balance? I'm saying that universities, we should not be working for universities in order to um, to go get some work-life balance. Can we learn something from our panel about work-life balance in industry? I don't know. I found when I was in academia, which was a while ago, that universities had a relatively good work-life balance compared to a lot of things I've done. Yeah, I miss it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I think there's really different expectations. Yeah, um, now, consulting is never probably a good, um, a good example of work-life balance, but it really does depend on the team that you work for. So in my team, we had a lot of mums and the partner that we worked for was a parent. So we didn't have meetings outside the nine to five. I used to get kicked out at 5.15, go pick up your kids, Steph. Um, whereas a lot of other teams that I had experience with, you know, they'd have... 8 a.m. meetings, they'd have 7 p.m. meetings. There were so many meetings um, outside of hours. Um, and teams that were, say, less, less understanding of people's need for space. Um, Transurban's quite good from the work-life balance, but I made that very clear going over. And that's one of the advantages of being mid-career and having a certain seniority. You can sort of say, this is what I'm coming for. Um, and, and this is how it's going to be. But that's not always an option for everybody. I don't know, Sarah, how, how do you find it? Is your consulting team failing on the, you have a life also? No, I think it is quite different though. Yeah. Yeah. I think like the team itself, where they're very good in terms of, we do have sessions every week where you, like, I mean, it's kind of, it's the kind of job where you have to have sessions every week to monitor yeah. sustainability. And we do fill out surveys every week about our, um, how many hours of billing, how we're feeling about our, kind of our KPIs outside of work but you do have to set those KPIs like your key perform like what you want to achieve out of work like if you want to go for a walk three times a week if you want to have a night off you have to say that in advance <laughs> and the team will kind of help you work around that um it's not kind of like the balance where you are like I've had only one meeting recently at night time or sometimes you have like, like a such a bad expert who's based in London or something so you have to be up a little bit later um but it's mainly at my work, your meetings happen during the day, the work has to get done. So you have to do it after hours. <laughs> um, and we often work on very short timelines. Um, so a normal day for me would probably be like, start work at nine. Good being at home at the moment because you can get out of bed at 8.30. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have to go to the client site tomorrow at 8.45. So that's not as fun. But um, often we'll work until like six, have two hours off and then working again, depending on like what needs to be due until like nine or 10 or 11 or 12. So, <laughs> but then I get my eight hours sleep still because I'm working from home. So it's all right, I guess. Um, but it's kind of just like there is short turnovers, um, which I kind of, kind of is like makes this consulting the way it is. Some people, I say, I guess I'm kind of new. So the, the newer you are, the longer it takes to get used to it as well. So people, my first PL, definitely didn't work as late as I did not because he didn't like like he just was very organized and didn't have to work as late as I did so um it apparently does get better um and different yeah. cases are different yeah. so depending if your case is like a four month long case or eight week long case that can make a difference as well um I guess think reflecting back to academia I, I remember like academia can be a lot of work as well but it's kind of your own self-drive I found and like is that you have the it's like you're working what you want to work on whereas like in consulting you're working what your client wants to be worked on and so there's a different feeling in terms of it was, it was longer hours it was like this kind of I did work weekends sometimes in when I was in my PhD or like long during the night but it felt different because I wanted to be doing that not that I don't want to be yeah. working I love my job but it's a different feeling um where I guess yeah it's in like, research you are it's kind of like your own day. boss yeah yeah <laughs> And look, yeah. so I'd say Sarah's experience in consulting is quite common, but it depends on where you end up. So I never worked hours like that, except, you know, there would be the occasional thing because I just can't. 
I literally cannot work those kinds of hours um, without becoming a very sick person very quickly. Um, and so some projects that you work on, depending on who you work for, um, you can be sorted into projects that work better for your life. So I once spent nine months on secondment with an organization. Um, and I think I've worked over time, maybe twice during that time. Um, other things, it was, you know, particularly um, during global emergencies, we might be working a lot. Um, but then again, I think everybody was at that time as well. So I think, you know, these experiences are common, but the important thing to remember about consulting is that they don't necessarily have to be your experience over the long term. Um, and one of the advantages of consulting is that fluid, quite, quite fluid team structure. And as you find your feet, you can find your people who work like you work and work on projects that work for your life. Um, some people love the work until 12, get up at six, we're gonna keep working. Um, some people really thrive on that and, and more power to them. I personally, I got like three days of that in me and then I get to be very dark with Steph. Like we're talking, what numbers don't know? Code, no. <laughs> What about I will now? say that at BCG, at least, uh, I'm not sure other places, but Fridays are usually pretty chill. Um, and then um, weekends are usually protected. So that's pretty good. And I guess like I don't have any, like I don't really have any family at the moment. I don't even live with my partner. So I'm pretty much on my own. Um, and I can imagine as, you know, life progresses more, if you move in with someone, you've got to actually talk to them. Um, <laughs> and then as you get a family, people become better at setting boundaries. Um, yeah, but, yeah, but at that point in my life where I can just... If it's exciting work. and fun for you and you're enjoying it, then it's the right thing. If yeah. you find yourself, you know, becoming fatigued, and that was my main reason for leaving, I was working a lot less hours than Sarah. And obviously for me, I was becoming extremely fatigued mm -hmm. uh, mentally and physically with that. Um, you look very I, well rested, Steph. I yeah, have been sleeping good. every single night. It's been amazing. Um, <laughs> And for me, it's also been a mental thing as well because I've got better control over my projects. Um, and so there's much less stuff. We need someone to get out there and just, just come up with something. Have you had that one yet, Sarah? Um, we not yet. Quiet yes. this. So just <laughs> thought it out. <laughs> 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 yeah. I did that a few times. <laughs> um, yeah. How about you, it's Melanie? How, how have you found the transition work-life balance-wise? Yeah, it's been to find interesting. It. So somebody also started in my team who was working in consulting. Mm. And I find that when I was in academia, I would work in the evenings and on the weekends. And also because, you know, you might be working on three projects, but also you would be invited to review papers or you'd be invited to review grants or be on committees. And now um, the I keep getting told that I shouldn't work in the evenings. Uh, like they keep saying, protect your work-life balance. Um, don't, you know, like don't work after five o'clock. Um, the other guy in consulting and I obviously both have been working long hours. And so I'm working for a big bank that's an employer of choice for women and very family friendly. But um, things like, okay, so my laptop died and then I couldn't get anything working and I eventually got it working about 4 p.m. and then I worked till 8 p.m. Um, I'm also a single mom, Steph, but my kids are every alternate Friday. Yay! <laughs> um, the, my kids were with their dad that Friday. So I worked, I worked till 8 o'clock because I just wanted to get something done. And my colleague's like, no, don't. Like, you know, don't work in the evenings. Just, it's, like, I, just, I love how different it is and um, I can imagine that consulting is long hours as well but when I was in academia there was you know I was kind of my own boss so I could say yes to way more things or you know the university has a list of things you have to do to get for promotion but now my boss or my boss's boss will say oh so for a start my immediate boss went on paternity leave for three months and I was like yay um, he was putting his family first so then I had my boss's boss and they would say things like, no, don't work on that. Like they would say, you're welcome to work on that, but we don't think that project is actually going to go anywhere. So they help me guard my time and they help me from being like an over workaholic. <laughs> um, That's good. They, 
they continually tell me to stop working, not work long hours. It's glorious. I love it. That's awesome. How about you, Zoe? Is work-life um, balance at Camper good? Yeah. Work-life balance at Camper is great. Um, there are a couple of points I want to bring up in terms of work-life balance. At Canva, um, at Canva, you know, work-life balance is pretty good. We're an Australian tech company, and I think we're very much driven by, you know, the Australian culture of work is nine to five, and then in general, you know, your hours outside of work are your own. Well, I think in tech companies, particularly in the US, you do find that employees will often work overtime. Um, certainly employees are incentivized to stay at work for longer, I would say. You know, they get given free food, they do gym at the office and yeah. all of these incentives um, to make you go into work, although I'm sure that's very different now in um, COVID times. Um, but I think because Canva is an Australian tech company, we don't really have that pressure to consistently work overtime. Um, and I will say the data analytics team rarely deals with issues or they rarely deal with putting models into production. Um, so if we break a data analytics pipeline, sure it's bad because we might lose a fair bit of data, but we're not breaking the end user experience um, and that would be far worse. So I think the people who are front-end developers and back-end developers face more pressure, hmm. um, but there's less of that on the data analytics side. Nice, good. Um, all right, um, keep adding questions to Slido or voting, voting ones that you want me to ask. The next on the list is, what is similar to, about the job you have now to the job you have pre previously? And what is most different about your current position to where you're working before? Similarities and differences. Who wants to take it? I'll go for it. So um, both of my roles are obviously quite technical. Um, hilariously though, what is really different is that in consulting people want me to uh, communicate away from my PhD skill, whereas here in industry I'm just one of many, many, many PhDs in this team. Um, lots and lots of engineers about, so in a lot of ways it makes what I'm doing a lot easier because I don't have to be in this continuous state of parallel translation. Uh, on the other hand, I'm now the hard-nosed business person, so that's fun. <laughs> so that's, that's a lot of fun, actually. It's very ironic. Um, what is similar is that I still need to be creative about my solutions, that it's still down to me to decide how we're going to deliver on this, and it's still me creating the project plans and the, and the bringing up the junior team members and so on. So that part hasn't changed at all. Do you, want, do you want to come and sit with me? Yeah. More close and joining those. Me. Nice. But that's all right. Awesome. You, you were there the first um, hour. Anyone else want to share similarities and differences? Um, okay, I can think of it. Um, so, one, like I think, when I think about presenting, presenting what you've done. Um, so, I think in academia, all the conference talks I went to and all the ones I gave, they're kind of really leading, like justifying every step you've done along the way. Um, making sure that by the end people are convinced by the result when they probably won't be if <laughs> you missed some sort of step. Um, in consulting it's result first <laughs> and then like then later on comes the explanation and it's been really hard to kind of uh, to me just kind of training out of that like making sure you're really just people don't have a lot of time you got to get to like and you constantly you do have to make sure you are justifiable but constantly spending the time to like, oh, I did this and I did this and I did this, which led to this. It's good to say what you like, what the result is, what's the insight, what does it mean, um, and then get really bad, like, good at um, really showing, make make people not have to work to figure out what your slides are saying. You have to be really concise and um, direct people's attention to that. Mm -hmm. 
What's similar is it's really like uh, intellectually rewarding though. And I'm always, I was surprised at how much, uh, like I knew I'd be learning consulting skills, but I'm still always learning brand new technical skills as well. Um, I'm learning, you know, different languages, um, and learning analytics, for example, trend prediction, um, so many different things about different algorithms I didn't know about. Like one of my cases was supply chain simulation, which was completely brand new to me. It was all about, you know, fully modeling a system and that's all about simulation theory, um, distributions and sampling, like Monte Carlo simulations and it was brand new. And, but I guess the added, like I guess in academia, you have a lot of time to kind of think about it, model it to over, um, you know, get your head around it. Uh, but I guess the difference was, is that you kind of have to like be very quick smart and picking up these things and um, going with it straight away. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that kind of relates to a question that's like a couple down the list, but let's do it now so that we're like um, on the same train of thought. I'm thinking about a career in data science. What tools do I need to know? Is R preferred or should I learn Python as well or something else? What, are, what tools do you all use most and if somebody was thinking of heading into consulting or analytics where should they focus their learning time um i'm going to give it a crack because my talk has changed probably quite a bit um but r is um, for, like it is used like and it depends on what the client uses so if your client is fully based in r there's no point in you coming up with a python based solution because i'm not going to use it so if your client is lucky and they use r that's awesome but the reality is most of our clients um, happen to use Python um, and that's what I've had to pick up so I was able to get away with using R on one of my first projects just because it wasn't being productionized or anything and we could just it was a proof of concept so I could use R as my first case that was a bit nice to me um, but the rest of the project was on in Python so my bit was on an R uh, but the reality is that all my other projects since then have been in Python that's been one of the things I've had to work on. Um, Did you know any Python when you started Sarah? Um, I could read it, I guess, and I had done a course, uh, like, I think, try, I, I think on my, one of my PhD projects, the goal was to, I had like, oh, I'm going to code it in R, I'm going to code it in Python at the same time, but then I didn't have enough time, so it's a little in R. Um, but by the time I came around to it, it, I had forgot a lot of it. Um, data manipulation in Python is kind of, it feels like you're going back to the base R manipulation. Um, there's no, like, nice deep flyer and piping and group, like, there's, it is a group by, there's no select and filter. Um, so my tip for that would be just if you're learning Python, you just can't look at R. You have to like immerse yourself in Python and just <laughs> you have to pretend that R and the tidyverse don't exist. You just yeah, have you have to, to like retrain yourself. There is no better and, option than this. Yeah, and like to remind yourself, there are times where I remember like getting so frustrated, like doing exercises and like this makes no sense, um, but pushing through and then like obviously when you've been put on a case, so you have to do it. You, and you look back, you know, three months later, and you're like, wow, I'm so much better than when I started. Um, another thing I would learn is it's, it's kind of hard to have a license, but Tableau is awesome. <laughs> um, I love it. It's like, so people good. say ggplot is amazing, uh, but Tableau is even better if you want a really quick graph, like table or graph or something of your data. It just looks good straight away. It's how I want to do a lot of my sense checking in. So if I've got a data set, I want to quickly see like how it summarizes. I put in Tableau, see what the trends are. And that's how I picked up a lot of data errors. Um, and I think SQL, I haven't had to type oh, it up yeah. myself much, but SQL has come up as like a lot of the analysts we interact with are doing all the like, big database systems. Um, and knowing that is quite advantageous as well. Yeah, I would say that SQL is the most important language to learn if you're dealing with large databases. Um, at Canva, we're dealing with millions of users who create you know, several designs in a month. Um, so your SQL really has to be solid. The good thing about SQL though is Deplier is essentially very similar to the SQL syntax. So if you know Deplier, you can pick up SQL fairly quickly. Um, but I guess just having some sort of familiarity with how to query a database um, in R, you can use dbplyr, um, which is kind of a great introduction to accessing remote databases. Um, but yeah, if you want a job in tech in particular, or any kind of industry where you're dealing with big data, 
you should probably learn SQL. It's not that hard to learn though. It's not really like learning a whole new language. Okay. It's just like deployer and a few extra functions. Cool. How about you, Melly? You said you're not really using R. You don't use R? Oh, um, so no, I am mostly using R, but I um, would, so our, our organization is trying to, is trying to get everyone to move into Python. So if I, um, learning, I would highly recommend everyone who learns Python. Um, and, but also we're doing some things in R and some things in Python. Um, also SQL, yes, totally. So for the project that I'm working on now, we download the data using SQL code and do some analysis in R and then we're doing some plotting in Python. Um, and yes, so they're all useful. Oh, but, cool. Sorry. Oh, I've asked a lot of people because I was just kind of like, I don't know, I feel like six months ago, I really didn't know, like Belinda will confirm this, I really didn't know very much R at all. But um, so I was like, oh, what should I prioritize? And I basically started mostly learning R because my boss uses R and I reverse engineer his code. But um, Python is the way of the future, is the general. Sorry, sorry, R ladies, but. It's okay, <laughs> um, it's okay. <laughs> uh, people also say you can do a bunch of really cool statistics in R that you, um, they both have a really, they're both useful for particular tasks and you can do some, you know, it's good to know both and SQL. And, and I love Tableau. How, like, how amazing is Tableau? I just don't know why they don't teach it to uni students or it's like, I wish I had known Tableau. It's just, I love it. My experience is a little bit different. So I come from a multidisciplinary team, much like Sarah's. A lot of Python users, a lot of Java users, Tableau, Till your cars come home, Power BI, the whole deal. Alteryx was a big one. Um, at Transurban, I run my own team. We are our focused, but we're a rapid prototyping team, right? So we need to smash through models real fast. And we're also creating a lot of really specific um, things that haven't been done before as well. Um, when we go into production, uh, we will probably be doing that with Dockerized containers. Um, but I'm lucky that I'm in a small enough environment that I can just wander over to the chief data scientist and go, mate, mate, I want to be your best customer, mate. Um, and you can get away with a lot that way. And you can make those connections that you need um, to, to do the technology you want. So for example, in advanced time series work, again, particularly for the econometrics canon where I need to pull out coefficients and elasticities that I can have inference on, R is clearly the best option. It, just, it was made by statisticians for statisticians. So it's great. Um, but if I was out at client site, then chances are it would have fought a really big uphill battle to get R into production. And it's not always the best option to fight for one particular technology to the exclusion of all others. Um, I'm just in a good place right now. <laughs> I get to choose. This is fantastic. Lucky, lucky, lucky. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. oh, go one thing, one, one thing I would mention is at least at Canva, Git is very important. Yeah, Git. How could we So forget? learning how to use version control um, and dealing with different branches, like we all make different branches for separate projects and then we merge into the master branch which then gets run overnight, like it's, it's a big thing. Um, and yeah. so some familiarity with, with GitHub is really useful. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah, awesome. Um, all right, next question. What are companies hiring data people looking for? What skills do you think that you brought to your current position that maybe other candidates didn't have? It might depend on the job. Yeah. Um, so like BCG Gamma hires a lot of different positions in data science. So I'm in the client facing consultant track. But we also have data science engineers, um, we have non-client facing analysts as well. I think what makes what BCG is looking for in data science consultants are essentially generalist consultants and measurement consultants who know how to code as well, uh, which is quite right. a unique subset <laughs> of people. Yeah. Um, so management consulting kind of, you really have to be able to 
have the skills of being able to talk to the client, understand a problem, understand where the business value is. And then I guess you have then the added layer of being able to then translate that to a data science solution. So how are you going to use analytics to help solve the problem at hand? And it's, you know, the people who do well in consulting aren't the best at hyperparameter tuning or um, like writing the best code. Well, that's really important. We need it, like, you know, good models and good code. It's people who can look at a problem and be like, yeah, I know how, what I'm going to do. I know how to realistically do it. I know how to get it um, communicated communicate those risks and what I get organized with the client, get things done, um, and then present that on a reasonable scale and show value in what you've done. And you can yeah. usually can put a dollar value on what you've done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Problem solving, so interpersonal good. skills, and can code. Those like, yeah. Yeah. co-occur and relatively few people. What they hire me Transurban for. I mean, my team has lots of PhDs. Right. So I'm not the smartest person in that team by a long shot. Um, but my job is really about doing exactly what Sarah said. They got plenty of people that can write code. They got plenty of people that understand technical stuff. My job is to work out how we're going to use that and design the solution. Um, I'm writing a lot of code at the moment, but I'd say probably within the year, I'll be completely off tools. That's just how that one's going to roll. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry, I'll have like this complete legacy of R. Nobody will ever be able to move away from it. I am just locking it in. <laughs> How about you, Zoe? Um, yeah, I like Canva. I think the main thing data analysts have to show, um, yeah, business value for their work. Um, I think one key thing is you have to be kind of curious and looking for patterns or outliers in data. Um, but I think a key part of the role is also explaining it well to everyone else in the business who, you know, they know nothing about data or statistics or um, like experimental design or whatever. And also they don't necessarily want to know about it either. They just want the, um, they just want to know at the end of the day, how has it improved the business? Um, and you kind of have to, have to deliver that information to them without making it too complicated. Just keep it simple and um, yeah, easy. Yeah. How about you, Mel? What did you bring to this job that maybe other people didn't have? It's, good. Um, it's a great question. I'm not really sure. Um, I think maybe it was um, the confluence of uh, like people skill, like being able to communicate. I definitely, I admitted or I said to my boss, I'm really not that strong in R, but I have a willingness to learn. Um, and, but I'm really good at communicating with really, really smart people and stakeholders and kind of being the in-between person. So it's possibly that. Mm. Um, yeah. There are, there's some, on the team, there's a bunch of people. So in the, in my team at work, there's people who are really, really good at SQL, really, really good at R, at Python, but not perhaps um, the soft skills, mm. but um, maybe that's, you know, I'm not really sure <laughs> what, why they hired me, but um, I think it was the confluence of those things. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, so um, how did you get your current jobs? Were they advertised or did you know someone who knew someone who tapped you? What was the process of finding the, your job that you're in right now like? I was referred. Um, so my friend Kitty, who started with me as well at the same time at February, in February, uh, Kitty used to work at BCG as a journalist many, many years ago, maybe like 10 years ago or something, before they even had a big like analytics team. She was as a journalist consultant. Um, then she left and she did her PhD and then she was like a postdoc researcher at UCID. And then someone who she um, worked with and now started the advanced analytics arm was very, it was like an established group and it asked her if she wanted to come back. Um, she did the process and then once she got hired, 
um, she referred me, which was really nice of her because I hadn't even heard of BCG before, like the big companies like McKinsey or BCG, I'm like, what's management consulting? I don't know. Um, <laughs> and then I got referred and then I went through interview process and then um, that's how I got the job. And most, I think most of the people who, uh, we do have like an online portal, it's always open, but most of the referral, like people who get hired, I think are refer through referrals. Right. You know. um, I applied to Canva via LinkedIn. Um, they had an open, I guess, call for applicants. Um, and I submitted my resume and I don't even think I wrote a cover letter. Um, yeah. but the great thing about tech is that it's really just about your resume and that's it. You don't need to write a cover letter or anything. So I just kind of submitted it. Wasn't expecting to hear anything, but they gave me a ring and I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll go for the interview. But yeah, you definitely don't need to know people in the company before um, applying. Interesting. How about you, Mel? Um, I have an interesting story. So I was applying for jobs since November, but then in about March or, oh, I ticked the box on LinkedIn. It was just purely through LinkedIn. I unticked or ticked. Um, open to recruiters and a random person who I'd never met before said, are you interested in a data science job? And I said, yes, yes. Um, and then we had a phone conversation and um, I did the, you know, like, are you a psychometric test? And then I had a, then COVID started. So I don't know how many of you also started during COVID, but I had a phone conversation with the recruitment consultant and then um, one of my old colleagues who I used to share an office with, who kind of sits where near where you sit now, Belinda, she said, oh, um, she works at this bank as well. She said, there's a hiring freeze next Monday, so uh, you better hurry up. And so on Thursday, I rang the recruiter and said, um, I was told that there's a hiring freeze, so I'm happy to expedite this and speak to the person tomorrow. So uh -huh. we had a um, Zoom slash WebEx when everybody's kids were video streaming and the um, video was so crap that I don't think you could see my face. Um, I, I put makeup on. <laughs> but anyway, then they said, um, so we just had a um, voice conversation meeting. Oh, and he also, uh, they asked me to write 200 words about why I wanted the job, I guess, to see if I could write a coherent paragraph. And then on Monday at two o'clock they said there is a hiring freeze it kicks in tomorrow if you can get three referees online in the next three hours by 5 p.m you can have a lot of offer if you can't no job so i was like ah um yeah but um i did so i had two distinguished professors who are my actual referees but of course they're in meetings because one of them was like a counselor on the climate council and another one's just an arc laureate fellow so i was like oh who have i worked with who can i ah like wreck and who have I worked with and who will have free time in the next three hours so I went through like um so one of the answers to the other questions is like network like make friends with people be friendly to people so the fact that I was able to ring three people and say could you write a referee form for me about what you know about my skills and get it in in the next three hours please um that <laughs> Uh, yeah, and and then um, I still have never met my boss in real life. I have never met a single person from my entire team, and I've been working for them for six months. So, wow! Oh my goodness, there is so much in that. I don't know what my follow up question is. Um, so <laughs> LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, so LinkedIn. It seems across a few of you, LinkedIn was a thing. Um, how? I don't know anything about LinkedIn. What What is LinkedIn and how do you get a job via LinkedIn? Oh, you, it's, it's kind of like Facebook for, but for, for your career. So um, you put where you work, you put like a little bio about yourself. And then if you do things like write conversation articles or win prizes or, you know, publish whatever, like if you, or if you write a blog post, then you'll put it up there. And um, so um, I had, people will refer you for your skills. So like, I don't know, 43 people said I knew about climate change and experimental design or something. So uh -huh. actually, and this was handy as well. So my current boss 
looked me up on LinkedIn and saw that we had a mutual friend who did a PhD in Macquarie Biology and he now works as a data scientist at CBA. So I think the fact that we had a mutual person in common helped. So um, I think LinkedIn may not be that useful for academic jobs, but if just um, totally, yep. Very it, useful. Yeah. yeah. For me, I think it, it just, um, I get it to a social media platform where you can use it as a social networking thing, but I don't really. Um, but it's a place where you can kind of like check the box just to let the recruiters know that you're interested in hearing about jobs. And, you know, they'll contact you if something sounds like it might fit with your background. Um, so there are a lot of recruiters on there and you can also see like open positions. So I have like a constant alert and I get emailed every morning for data analyst, data science roles that mention R in the description. Yeah. Handy. Awesome. The other question I had was, um, Zoe, you said you just submitted a resume and no cover letter. Um, <laughs> how do you turn your resume into something that data science companies think it is good and yeah. I know that you have a website that has really good examples of the code that you do but how key do you think having a blog or a portfolio or a website that showcase or even like good github repos that showcase your skills how key do you think that might be um yeah I think it's pretty important at least I think it was a key reason why I was hired, just because I could show that I had this, I had this public portfolio of work, not just in terms of a website or a resume, but um, I also developed like R packages. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can get quantifiable metrics for that. You know, you can say, I don't know, 10,000 people have downloaded an R package that I developed. Um, and I think that really stands out. And I mean, not everyone has to be a package developer to get a job in data analytics or data science. Um, but I certainly think like it doesn't, it doesn't hurt, you know. Yeah. Um, and if you can point to some examples of here's the work that I've done, here's how other people might be using it. And, you know, you can go and look at the code yourself and check that it's not that i'm just not you know making this stuff up like i actually do this work yeah. um and i might be of use for you and you can see that before you even interview me so i think yeah it does help it does help i wouldn't say it's unnecessary like i wouldn't say it's necessary but it helps yeah and i think the point there about you know contributing to open source can can be extended as well, because even if you're not in a place where you're ready to be developing our packages or something like that, by contributing to open source or by being a part of our ladies or some other part of the community, you're also showcasing your soft skills um, and working on your network and things like that. So no matter where you're up to, you know, are you a, a gun developer or are you just starting out and learning, there's nothing wrong um, with you know being part of the community so a lot of the the involvement that i have with the open source community isn't actually technical um you know i don't contribute actively to packages i've got some stuff on github but you know you'll have a look it's been ages but you know i might be involved with our open sci or with our ladies where i can and things like that and as you move up through your career these soft skills are what you live and die by um, you know, the people that I worked for, they wanted somebody hands-on in this particular case. But like I said, I, in a year's time, how well I code is not actually going to matter. For me, at this stage of where I'm up to, it's about how I project plan, how I design, how I bring on other coders. And so that involvement um, speaks to those soft skills as well. So like Zoe said, you know, having that portfolio is, is awesome but don't feel like you have to have a certain standard to be able to participate or get the benefits from that. There's lots of ways to contribute that will help your career. And, and the parrot totally agrees with me. He's now talking <laughs> a lot. He gets to the stage in, in meetings and starts contributing. 
his thoughts. Something to say. Um, Sarah, how did your recruitment process go? Did you how did, did you um, submit a resume, and were they interested in seeing code that you had written? Yeah. Um, so once Kitty referred me, a recruiter from the company reached out to me, and I submitted a resume. Um, it was just what I had on. I didn't really jazz it up or anything. It was kind of what I had on hand. Um, and then they, I had to go through a two-hour online coding test. Uh, it, was, oh. it was something called HackerRank, so you can see what it's like. It is, uh, you can pick R between R and Python. Uh, it's the, I guess the most daunting thing was that you type code and you submit it, but you can't actually see the output. All you know is if it executed or not, but you don't know what the ah. error messages were or anything. <laughs> and you had no two hours. Way. Yeah. No, it's tell me, tell me you're allowed to Google. <laughs> No, I don't think you were supposed. I don't think they monitor you or anything. I, I, I'm not. I don't want to like get caught out saying wrong things about it. Um, but from what I remember, it was very stressful. Um, but I, I passed. Code, um, it was marked God. by a human, which was nice, not a, a machine. So I think even if it didn't run properly, um, someone was actually looking at it and they could tell if it was like a small bug or something. Um, there was like testing on machine learning and data cleaning and stuff like that. If you knew how and if you knew how algorithms worked and stuff. Um, then I went through four case interviews. So you started off with um, a project leader, then you went up all the way, the last interviews with the managing director and partner. Um, and it was all about getting to know you. And then the case interview is kind of like a, a, a data science in the context of business problem. In fact, my last case wasn't even about data science at all. It was all like a journalist consulting problem. Um, and then, then you get to ask some questions. And it definitely, like the, um, when they were asking questions about me and they had the, my resume in front of them, um, I put my website on there and my involvement in our ladies. And I did come, I, I think at least two people who I interviewed with did mention that and say how much they liked it and how much I was in, like, involved in these kind of organizations. Um, so yeah, I don't think it definitely, definitely can't hurt. And yeah. it definitely helped me like, when I was in my PhD as well, like getting presenting skills and, um, learning how to showcase your work. Um, I definitely have, I haven't updated my web. I think my website still says I'm a PhD student at UCID. <laughs> so it's been a long time since I've updated it. Um, but it was definitely a good thing to do. So when Sarah was talking to, to some people in my team, Sarah's website was definitely something that I sent around on the download. Um, <laughs> and so I was able to say, hey, Al, this is the person I'm talking about. And it spoke to her more than a resume did. Um, so Al was our partner and Al's not super technical. And when I say not super technical, he has people for that. Um, so he was never going to look at this and say, why, yes, I believe that Sarah's preference for the tidyverse is an important part of her contribution here. What he was seeing was how she expressed herself and that she could take technical terms um, or technical concepts and talk to those and how she solved problems. And so there was a lot of stuff that even non-technical people who might be interviewing you uh, can get out of your website or your portfolio. So don't feel like it has to be at a certain standard that if I'm not putting PhD papers up there, there's no point or it's not good enough. You know, a bunch of stuff on my website is really simple, random stuff um, that people then see how it is that I tackle a problem and things like that. Even if it is really simple to start with, you're also showing how you're growing as a professional as well, because that's something that interviewers really look for. What's your trajectory as a professional? Are you tapped out? Is this as good as you get? Or do you have a growth mindset? Are you someone that comes into a problem and says, I don't know everything, but here's how I'm gonna tackle it. Or here's the people that I'm gonna ask, or I'm gonna ask for help when I need it. And these are the sorts of things that you get from community participation, whether it's blogs, whether it's GitHub, whatever it is. This is something you can also talk to when they say, when was the last time you tackled this at work? And you go, crap, never done that one at work. Well, I haven't done this one at work, but I solved a problem like this once on my own time as a personal project. Yeah. So that can be really happy too. Uh, Sarah and Zoe, would you put a link to your websites in the chat so that anybody who wants to stalk them um, can? Yeah. And 
And Mal, thanks for posting that in the chat. What transferable skills do PhD graduates and academics have that we don't realize? Experimental design, critical thinking, mass and stats, coding, writing, big picture thinking, and curiosity. It sounds like all of those skills are really well valued. It's in very the transferable. Totally transferable. Yeah, and it's like a yeah. mindset as well. Like in research, you naturally know that you don't know everything. That's yeah. The point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And being able to admit that you're wrong, I think. So I think when one is a PhD student and also having been working in universities for a while, you're surrounded by people who have the same skill set as you. But what's become apparent is that there are um, a bunch of skills which um, I've written down there that you actually learn during the process of a PhD, which are really super useful. So if people can articulate them in their CVs or cover letters, then they'll really help you yeah. get a new job. Mel, how did you go about converting your academic P um, CV, which is about grants and publications, and into yeah. one that was looked like something that a finance company would say, "Yes, she's That's she's a really good question." Um, it, it was kind of um, a couple of year process, and I, I felt quite daunted at first. So it was a bit of an iterative process, and I. Um, started it and then this comes back to networking as useful. I showed it to a colleague, a colleague who had also left university for industry and then she made some comments and then she sent me her CV and I was like, ah, okay. And also um, I applied for a number of jobs. So I think each time I applied for a job, I um, tweaked it a little bit. Uh, also, I had two really good recruitment consultants. So um Precision, um, Emily from Precision, I think she places people in data science in Sydney and she was um, amazingly generous and I was like dashing off to a conference in Perth and I didn't really have time to update it, but she went through and she said, um, take this out, put this in. There's this kind of structure, which I can't remember, it's like star or something like put, um, what was the problem and what did you achieve? And it's not like 17 publications or $2 million in grants. It's like there was this problem and this was the business solution and this is the value that we added. Or not the business, but um, kind of put how you solve problems in your CV. Uh, also, I so I did show my CV to about three or four people over the whole process. So each time it got slightly better or more polished. Yeah. But it's a great. Also, um, at Macquarie, there's a there's a group of people or a person. Um, they can help you um, edit your CV. Uh, I think it's um, is it Sally? Well, do you know? Um, there's a there's a group of people or a person, and you they can take your CV, have a look at it, and help you edit it, which is pretty cool. Yeah, so I'm sure probably at the university. university. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sally's cool. in learning HDR learning skills. Yeah. Um, but there is there is Career Hub um, at Macquarie and I'm sure there's an equivalent at other universities. Yes. Um, I definitely at reaching out to a friendly um, and asking if they take a look at your C V. So when I say a friendly, sorry, that's a consultant speak as well. Um, yeah. Reaching out to somebody in your network that maybe is in a place um, that can help you can be really helpful. So not everyone's got the time, so don't just sort of flick it out there without letting people yeah. know. Maybe sort of say something like, hey, you know, we've had a few interactions or, or what have you. I'm looking to do this. You know, I, I was wondering, could you set aside 15 minutes to look at my CV for you, me? People will sometimes say no. Um, you know, I'm just really swamped right now. I'm sorry. But sometimes, particularly if you're coming at it as, you know, part of a network like our ladies, they might be able to say, Look, I'm really sorry I don't have time right now, but Zoe just got this great job at Canva. So do you want me to ask if she wouldn't mind? Yeah. You know, and Zoe, I do that. And then Zoe says, sure, no problem. Or sorry, I'm swamped too. Maybe Sarah's got time. And then we leverage that community, uh, that community that we've got because, yeah. you know, I don't think that any of us got here on our own. It was right. always a part of being part of that community. And how do we keep that going? Totally. I think that's a good tip, Steph. Yeah. Um, the next question, maybe I'm going to point this one to Mel. Um, lots of the panelists have backgrounds in stats. Um, for those who have PhDs or degrees in other areas, how do you go about 
getting up to speed on this on the stats that you need um yeah it's a really good question because i didn't i didn't really i didn't do computer science i didn't do stats i got a phd in tree physiology and then um i worked under a really excellent statistician so on one level i maybe picked up what to do well by osmosis but um since then I've been um, having a growth mindset, as Steph says, and um, learning in the evenings doing courses on Kaggle and Coursera. So um, I think you do actually learn a lot about stats and data analysis while you're doing a PhD, but it's not so structured. So doing the courses in the evenings and the weekends, uh, I've been doing R and also Python and um, SQL courses on Coursera and Kaggle and um, Data Camp before there was the controversy. Um, so they help kind of take you step by step. Um, you can get certificates that you can put on LinkedIn if you want. And they, I think they kind of like solidify all the stats that I picked up by osmosis. So when I was doing the PhD and working in academia, I would have a data set and a question and I would say, what's the best statistical approach to address this? So you kind of like pick up like this and that and, you know, PCA, but not like a structured from beginning to end. What are all the tools? So um, studying in the evenings, I pay, I think it's like 70 bucks a month for a Coursera course and I really enjoy it. Helps me feel more confident as well. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And one thing I tell um, junior data scientists that I work with a lot is that self-study is awesome and it's really important and it can get you where you want to go. But sometimes I see, and I'm, you know, Mel, this is probably not such an issue for you because you're mid-career like me and you've got that perspective. Um, but I think sometimes early starters get worried about not knowing enough or... Yeah feel like they have to go and learn all of the things before they're ready um, or even that they have to learn all of the things to be a good data scientist or statistician or what have you and you don't like Mel and I we've probably been doing this for a while now um, and there's always another one that comes out there's always another model or an algorithm or you know the clustering system du jour or you know Julia's now out here um, you know there's always something else and it's always something that we are learning all the time. You don't need to know every single thing to be able to make a really fantastic contribution. Yeah, yeah. So and don't another bullet point. What is that yeah. that as well. My partner, I got, um, I found some mentors at work and one of them I was, you know, saying, I think this person's a legend. They just know, they seem to know everything. And I'm like, how do I be like you? You know, like I went to a case that was so different. Um, when I did my supply chain case. And I remember I had like, a, like pretty much panic attacks before the case. Cause I was like, I don't know anything about this. And you go, he went to me like, you know, you're just young in your career. The best thing is experience. So like, as you do this, another case, another case, another case, they might not be exactly the same thing, but you will learn to be like, oh, I did a very similar problem here. I'm going to apply that there. And he's like, it don't get so disheartened if you don't know straight away what the right answer is is all about learning from others and then as you get down under your belt so that's kind of reassuring to me um and it just sometimes you want to go from like a to b and you want to be the expert straight away but you forget there's like the journey that you have to get there after many many projects or clients and stuff like that so that's yeah i would yeah sorry sorry i would also say that i think in my experience from what i've noticed just like looking at job descriptions and available roles uh, right now, I don't think you necessarily need to be, I don't think you need to have a PhD in statistics. And you know, there are far more data analyst roles which are fundamentally about descriptive statistics than there are, say, machine learning engineering roles, especially in Australia. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think, Going back to what Steph said, like a good, having a, like a solid basis is enough. And if you're here already, you definitely are more than equipped to start applying for these jobs. Yeah. Yeah. One of when the things I'm, that I was going to add to the list. Oh, sorry, Steph. You go. So, yeah, I was going to say when I'm hiring somebody early career, 
or you know looking for somebody to add to the team to refer to or something like that i'm not trying to find somebody that is the perfect r programmer in fact r programming doesn't actually bother me at all i want to see some kind of programming that would be great just like I don't necessarily need someone that's got an honest degree in econometrics to join my econometrics team. What I need is somebody who can learn, somebody who's willing to learn. It's really um, reassuring. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that that's the growth mindset. I tell my junior team that managers have two jobs. One is, and am I allowed to swear a little bit, Jenny? Yeah, of course, go ahead. Yeah. One of those jobs is to get shit done, <laughs> and the yeah. other one is to teach the team how to get shit done so you can do it for me. It's a bit of a dead man's shoe situation. Um, yeah. And so my most important role as a manager or principal, whatever we're calling it, is to bring up the junior team. And what I'm really looking for when I talk to somebody is not, do you have a PhD in this very narrow field? It's how do you learn? How do you cope with that, with that unknowing? Right? Because that's our lives. We never know anything. Um, and how do you interact with the team? How do you interact with the broader team? Yes, technical skills are great, but my job is to build on the base of whatever it is that you walk in the door with, with me. You know, maybe that's C sharp, maybe it's Python, maybe it's R, maybe it's stats, maybe it's tree biology. Um, whatever, <laughs> don't care. <laughs> um, it, it's about that attitude that somebody has and that, that willingness to learn things. Um, Sure, if it comes down to it, yes, a PhD in stats and, and advanced art skills would be great, but that's not generally necessary. Yeah, that Melanie's point about curiosity and an openness and willingness to learn is much more important than specific skills in a, in a narrow area. Yeah, exactly, because we can take that and we can do a lot with it. Whereas if you're someone that's quite rigid, and like, you know, this is my thing. I do this kind of machine learning algorithm and that's my thing. And I do it in this way only. There's only so far I can go with you if you're not gonna come with me as your manager. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I meet very few of those people. Um, but when we're in that process, what I really like to see and talk to people about is, okay, what do you think about this? Because I don't need a bunch of people that'll agree with me. The person that I'm working with at Transover most closely is my two IC. She is amazing. She is fantastic. We come from very different backgrounds, but the number of times she kind of leans back in the Zoom meeting and says, but Steph, and that but Steph has saved us several months of work so far <laughs> because she's got a different perspective and she's bringing it in. And sometimes it's technical and sometimes it's not, but she's not me and she's perfect. She's the yin yeah. to my yang. I couldn't do better than have her. Um, and so that, that's what we need in teams, that diversity of thought. Totally, yeah. And for the PhD students on, on the Zoom, I think the take home message from that is that at the end of your PhD, you will end up being the expert in the specific tiny piece of whatever it is you've been studying for the last four years. And that's awesome. But if you want an industry job, then you've got to step back and say, all right, what have I learned about thinking and coding and learning new things from becoming an expert in that tiny piece to apply to the problems that this industry um, organization needs to solve. Yeah. yeah, cool. I think that's something that your network can really support you as well, because when you're in the yeah. weeds, you're so focused on, you know, my PhD was on asymptotic inference and in unit roots and panel data. Despite yeah. working in this field my entire career, it's come up exactly twice, <laughs> right? Um, and it was really hard to see myself as somebody with broad skills. And so sometimes, you know, have you ever noticed it's so much easier to write somebody else's blurb than your own? Get together with somebody and go, who am I? What do I do? Um, and, and just see how that goes. And they will see you in a completely different light to the way you see yourself. And, you know, chances are you're going to come out of that feeling a lot more confidence in yourself and go, actually, yeah, I could do other things that aren't just asymptotic inference. <laughs> nice. All right. The next question on the list is what does a day in the life of your job right now look like? 
What do you spend your day doing? How variable is it? How much control of that do you have? Um, okay. Uh, so the day of my life is, is what I don't have control over is the meeting, so I can look at my calendar and see where they all are. Um, a lot of internal meetings. So I guess I guess I start at the beginning. Wake up half an hour before work at the moment. Very lucky at the moment. Then um, I have a daily stand up. So stand up. I guess daily stand ups are quite. All my cases have had this kind of thing. So the whole check with the whole team. You're kind of checking in, getting a quick update, and a lot aligning. <laughs> uh, you're actually standing up? like No, oh, you're supposed to. So apparently in like the tech world, you're supposed to stand up because you're not supposed to, it's supposed to be quick. So I guess the philosophy is that if you're standing up, you want to sit down again. So you don't want to be comfortable. Right. Yeah. It's a <laughs> ritual. So if we're agile, which is very yeah. cool about that here. Um, the stand uh, up is, yeah, <laughs> supposed to be super short thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then what we do is we usually have, we have a thing called Jira. And so Jira is like this task manager tool. And we kind of talk to the tasks we've got, what's blocked, what are we doing? Um, we need any uh, guidance on a day, um, just make sure that we're all in line. Um, in this particular case, and I have like a check-in session with my data science team to delve more into the issues that we're talking about today. Um, if I have, I might have different meetings with the clients. Uh, once a week, we have showcases to show off what we've done for the week. Um, big blocks of time for coding, a lot of slide writing, <laughs> depending on the case. So if you've got more general, if you've got more management consultants, they'll do a lot more of the slide writing, but if there's more data science team, then you're doing the slide writing. Um, that's the way we make primary communicate. And then there's a lot of messaging on similar, a lot of Slack, um, talking to your teammates, getting their thoughts, um, getting code reviews, um, and then just working on, I guess it's very iterative. So you do something very quick and fast to get feedback on it. So you can make it better in a shorter time frame as opposed to um, the worst thing you can do is spend all your go off on your own for a couple of days, do something really deep and come back and it's like the wrong thing. So it's always constantly updating the team about where you're at um, and getting their feedback. So you're always like on track. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of, it's a lot of coding. Um, and I guess the higher up you get, it becomes less coding. Um, but for me, most of my days, yeah, either spent coding or writing slides or writing emails or being in a Zoom. A lot of Zoom. <laughs> Everyone's a lot of Zoom right now. Yeah. Um, Mel, what does your day look like? Um, kind of similar. Um, and I quite like it compared to uni university work as well. So we have a daily stand up, which is 15 minutes. And I, yeah, I think as Sarah said, you're supposed to stand up so you don't go for too long. And the people in our team say what we're working on. And um, I quite love how every day our boss says, are there any problems? Do you need any help with anything? And it's great, like, yes, uh, my laptop's Wi-Fi isn't working or yes, uh, this person, I need you to blah, blah, blah. Um, so also it kind of, um, it avoids the problem that I have observed in past in universities where the project, you might be on a three or a five year project, but um, people are so disparate or for whatever reason, nobody progresses on, a, there's a hurdle on a project and nobody brings it up for six months because, um, you know, there's communication issues. So, uh, and, and then we have some Zoom meetings uh, and I, I've blocked out in the middle of my day. Um, we have Microsoft Teams and there's this thing you can put in called focus. So I'll block out where I can actually um, work on tasks and do some coding. And I've been doing, doing some stats in R, which is quite fun. And then presenting that or turning that into um, getting the key points out at the moment I have about 50 graphs, but um, the stakeholders, I'm pretty sure, only are going to be looking at this for five minutes. So I'm just trying to bring out, what's the key message? What are the key points? Put them in a PowerPoint and also um, upload it on, on Confluence, which is kind of a bit like Jira, but this website. And we have, uh, once a week, I have a one-hour meeting with my supervisor. We talk about what's going on. Um, I have this delightful situation where I'm told to stop working about five or five thirty, which is very novel for me. And um, 
yeah, there's there's big kind of meetings like um, sprints and we're agile and we can kind of like duck into the, do we want to hear what the um, CEO of the big organisation is saying or if we actually have some work that we really need to do, we might just skip that and um, do our work. We have, we have the occasional online training like risk, uh, digital risk. Um, Steph's laughing as well. Yep. <laughs> So I've got through a lot of those. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're kind of good because you can see what the company's values are. Um, but yeah. uh, the thing that I, uh, so, that, you know, there's like one question is what's the difference between an industry or consulting job compared with academia? But then another question is what's post COVID, <laughs> what's a post COVID day like? So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've learned a lot of new terminology today and that <laughs> relates to one of the questions a tiny bit further down. Um, how did you learn the language of corporate and convince your new employers that you could do the job, speak the talk? Like Steph said earlier, um, I think I just was up front and I was like, hello, Steph children. Um, I was saying, I said, I don't know. I'm really not that strong on R, but I... Um, my PhD supervisor said, I don't want somebody who knows how to use this tool. I want somebody who has the right attitude and who is prepared to learn this tool. So um, I feel like there was, there was a bit of being thrown in the deep end and um, learning to swim. And it, after three months, there was a bit of an adjustment. But now I feel like I've picked up. I spent a lot of time saying, what's agile? What is agile? Like, I get the idea that it means you pull quickly, but... Um, What's a stand up? You know, what's a sprint? <laughs> um, all these things. So, you know, I, I think uh, an answer to the question, how do, you, how do you start a new job in COVID is like quickly somehow make friends with people or work out who are the people who will answer your random Zoom questions. And when you say, okay, can you tell me what a sprint is? How long does it last for? Do I have to go to all of them? Or, um, you know, and can you, what's agile? Um, or how do I set up my OneDrive on this laptop? Um, yeah. Those things are really Finding you friendly, that's what I could call it. Um, it's yeah. something that I would have to do every time we go to a, a client site. You find your friendly. Yeah. Um, and the person how do you that, do that yeah, that's mine. every team. It's much harder on mine. It is harder. Um, yeah. But, you know, your friendly is probably the person that reached out in your first week and said something like, hey, I saw that you were new. Welcome to the team. Or yeah. Something like that. yeah. There's you the key is to be an our lady everything. friendly. It's like you need to be the friendly for someone else so that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. It's actually a really good habit. It's yeah. actually really good. Mel, that point that you made about um, your manager saying things like, oh, does anybody need any help today? The best manager I ever worked with I, I worked in parallel with her quite a lot and I was sitting behind her for like nine months at a client site. And every single day she would say in her stand up, which is just like a little team meeting every day. Does anybody need support today on anything? I've got some capacity. If you need anything, just reach out. And I knew how busy she was because I was sitting next to her, but it didn't matter. Every day she'd say that because she was working a remote team, just like we all are. And she'd say that and every single day her team knew that if they did need help, that she was there to do that and that she saw that as her job. They weren't intruding. They were helping her do her job by reaching out. And so that's something I really tried to do with my teams because I just saw what a big difference that made when people are given permission to reach out and made to feel like this is, this is a normal and sensible thing to do and I'm glad you did. That's cool. Um, some advice giving. So if you had, if you were planning to move into the job, similar kind of job that you're in now in the next 12 months, um, what skills would you focus on picking up and how would you go about it if you had taken yourself 12 months ago? I would definitely spend a lot of time learning SQL. SQL, all right. I think that's my main, that would, that would be my main suggestion. Um, yeah, SQL and Python. Did you know any, did you know any SQL did, did, before you? Did, did I know SQL? No, not really. Um, we had a coding exercise as part of my interview process that was in SQL, but because I knew Deplier, I kind of just winged my way 
throw the whole thing. Um, SQL is essentially just a lot of like select group by left join queries. So if you know that from the plier, I don't think you need to spend much time learning SQL, but it's just the frequency in which we use it. Yeah. It's just, you just, you kind of have to know it or be willing to learn it fairly quickly. Yeah. I would also agree uh, being familiar with SQL and Py like Python, and probably at the level that you can read it. So like if someone gave you a script, you know, you probably wouldn't be able to, like, even if you didn't know how to write it yourself, but you could kind of get the gist of people to do it going, oh, I know what that's doing. Because I think the reality is if 12 months ago I started coding in Python, did a bit of it and stopped, you just forget all of it. And so be using it. Um, a lot of the time it's muscle memory and putting like things to practice. Um, and I'm really glad that between like my PhD, I was like thinking, oh, you know, I've got three months between my PhD and starting work. Should I be, you know, doing Python courses and stuff like that? And I'm kind of glad I didn't because that time I had between my PhD and ECG, I'll never get back again. <laughs> Let's yeah. take a leave of absence. Um, so like really enjoying that time. Like I would say if you've got a break and if you had a, you know, a hectic job beforehand, like I would take, I guess everyone's circumstances is different, but taking that break was really useful for me. So it's something I would, knowing like how to like take that time off. Um, and I guess like my biggest advice coming like to go into consulting is to learn become very familiar with feedback. Um, we're a very feedback driven business. Um, we get assessed every six months. Um, every case you get a score, multiple dimensions of giving scores to others. And to become very quickly, come, like at first I was very scared of it, but if you're very open, like, learn to be very open to feedback very early on, um, that is very, very useful. Um, like someone said to me that feedback is a gift. Like if someone didn't really care in your growth, they wouldn't even bother telling you if like how you could improve or where you went wrong. Um, but I, I guess it's really hard when you go into consulting, like you're getting a lot of feedback, <laughs> you know, you're not doing everything perfect the first time around. It's really confronting when you get to a new job. Yeah. Uh, wait a second. I was good at my old job or whatever I did. And just getting to that, to the understanding. So when I joined consulting, you know, it was a really rough six months as I tried to, <laughs> to get to my feet with all of that sort of stuff. And now yeah. that I'm at Transurban, I'm too consulting. <laughs> <laughs> so every place that you go has a slightly different take and just feeling comfortable with the fact that actually my value is consistent or increasing, but I'm just learning the new language and the new way of working here. This doesn't reflect on who I am because I can't do things perfectly when I haven't seen the perfect solution yet. Yeah. yeah. And I would say in terms of feedback as well, like um, if you can get the skills of like getting mentors as well, like mentors are so helpful in consulting, especially as a big business, you're working with different people every time. So to have senior consult, like senior mentors to help you along the way, that's been one of the biggest things for me. And so I, I, I probably, I think I, you know, I had mentors when I was at my PhD, I had Steph, I had my supervisor, I had people in my research group. And that really helped me come into my work to be comfortable to ask for help as well. Um, I guess every job's different, but at BCG, you're so lucky. Like, it's kind of intimidating. You know, every week you're talking to senior MD, like managing directors and partners in your case. Um, and I realise it's not often you get the chance to actually talk to senior people or companies. Um, and being able to know how to communicate with them and to, like, get to know them is really, really important as well. So, yeah, being good to, like, network. Like, the soft skills, I guess, is really important to build before you come in. Like, that's what I would tell myself not so much the technical skills, because there's so many things you cover, you might not even use them, so. Yeah, there's a question right here about soft skills. Oh, go Steph. So yeah, I was just gonna say, I think it's really important to, to recognize that you deserve that kind of treatment <clears throat> and that, you know, more than an, a company or more than a job title, you know, particularly when you're at the early stages of your career, you deserve a manager that will look out for you and give you positive feedback as well as constructive feedback to get you to that next level. And you deserve to have a team that supports you in that first six months as you're trying to understand your new world um, and will reach out and do the friendly and all of that sort of thing. These are things that everybody deserves to have in their workplace. And so when you're trying to decide where you go, 
for me, that's the first thing I look at. Um, you know, land, try and land in a place. It's, it's hard because you don't know anybody. Um, but those are the kinds of um, team cultures that will be with you when times are tough, that will, you know, reach out in the middle of COVID when, you know, you're stuck at home with three kids. Hey, kids. Um, <laughs> you know, and say, hey, you okay? Because you didn't sound okay. <laughs> Yeah. And things like that. And it makes your whole work experience and your, and your place in that organisation really, really different um, and lets you grow because it creates that psychological safety that you don't have to be perfect and that someone's got your back. And that's really important, I think. Totally. Steph, what tips do you have for people applying for a job um, in order to assess that? What questions do you ask or who do you talk to to work out whether this place is a place like that or whether it's a yep. place you should run away from? Yeah. One of the questions that I asked in my second PwC interview was, what do you do when somebody makes a mistake in your team? Ooh, the answer was waterboard them. Um, which, <laughs> Are you <laughs> serious? Sense of humor. <laughs> um, so that was obviously a joke. <laughs> Um, but that led to a whole conversation around, you know, what do we do when somebody makes a mistake? Because mistakes happen, right? Mm -hmm. Kidding mm -hmm. ourselves if we think they don't happen. What's going to happen when I make a mistake? Is my manager going to hang, draw and quarter me and, you know, and blame everything on me? Or is this a learning opportunity? Or is this a moment for us to say as a team, everybody turned up to do their best today. We know this team, everybody turned up wanting to succeed here. What was it about this situation that failed that person in their desire to be successful? Mm. Now, sometimes people stuff up because they've done something stupid or lazy, but in my experience, that is very, very small cases. When mistakes are made, it's generally because something got in the way. No one sat there and went, I'll be fucked, <laughs> right? Uh, so what was it that got in that person's way of succeeding? So that was a good way of discussing it. Um, asking people, you know, how they're going to mentor you or how are you going to support me as I grow as a professional? Uh, I'm going to send you to a couple of conferences. Maybe not. What is it that we do as a team? Um, who they bring to the interview is also really telling. Um, so particularly as women in analytics in quite a, a male dominated space, if they cannot field a woman to interview you, mm, at least as part of the yeah. process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a really yeah. good point. Um, and then I think there's also asking directly about team culture. I've been in interviews where I was more or less asked, was I comfortable being yelled at? Um, not directly, but that was the implication, um, to which my response was, yeah, but also I'm not treating my junior staff like that. Yeah. You can fuck right off if you think I'm going to be doing that because that does not teach them anything mm. except to hide things from me when things go wrong. Yeah. Right? So asking about these things, how do people respond when the chips are down? Because that's what you want to know. Everything's great all the time if things are going well. Everyone's happy. Asking about work-life balance is really important as well. And, and how do they achieve that, right? Because it's all very well and good to say, oh, we've got great work-life balance if everybody is, you know, <laughs> drowning after hours. Everyone does extra hours sometimes, but is this our, our regular? And how do we handle that? Yeah. yeah. And then you just kind of take a guess <laughs> and, and hope like hell. And that's sometimes it's just a gut feeling. Really yeah, and, and, you know, if you can, finding somebody in that space is super useful, but that's not always possible. So, yeah. You can also look at Glassdoor. If the company's big enough, they'll have great big reviews. People have, like, actual employer reviews of the interview process and then how they rated the job as well um, by position. So it, sometimes if the company's smaller, it's, like, not enough people who wrote, wrote in. Um, but definitely for bigger companies. Really specified. Like in consulting, everything hangs on the partner that you work for. Mm. Um, so the partner that I work for at PwC, like I still chat to him every week. Uh, I still chat to the team. Mm. He gave me my reference for Transurban. Um, he knew exactly what I was doing and why and all the rest of it. Um, and I'm still in contact with a whole bunch of team members like all the time. I've had like three 
text during this meeting from people from meetups. Um, and so everything comes down from the top. If you've got a nice manager, but the person on the top is, you know, trying to run the team into the ground, they can only protect you so much. So see who your ultimate reporting line is, if you can, and try and understand who they are and try and understand who they are by reputation, if you can. Because yeah. they will set the tone for everything that comes under. Yeah. All right, we're fast running out of time. So we're gonna do these next ones really fast. What is the greatest struggle in your new job? What's the hardest thing about your new job? Not going into the office and having to build relationships with people. But um, yeah. a solution that I found is when someone does something lovely or supportive or helpful, I'll send an email to them and their boss saying, I just wanted you to know, um, dear boss, um, this person's really, really helped me and it spills goodwill. And yeah, good tips. And, and when you get feedback from a stakeholder like that, um, forwarding it up the chain um, and particularly acknowledging, you know, the person in your team that did that. Oh, hey, we got this feedback from the stakeholder. Stakeholders were really happy. By the way, Zoe did a fantastic job on this piece. She really contributed to it by doing X, Y, and Z. Mm. Um, that can really help our junior team feel seen. Um, because it can be really hard when you're in the junior team to feel seen like you know yeah. you're the one carrying all the load um does anybody even know you exist so that can be really helpful yeah, yeah. and then those people can use it um in their i don't know performance evaluations <laughs> yeah. or um negotiations for bonuses or promotion or whatever so it's really it's useful for them and it's it's just a win for everyone yeah 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 good tips um, how much autonomy do you have in your job and how does that compare to your experience in research academia? Um, in my current role, I've got a fair bit of autonomy. Um, I'm more or less answerable to stakeholders rather than to a traditional manager at this point. Like I do have one <laughs> and if he's not happy, I'm not happy. Um, but I've got a lot more autonomy technically than I have had in some other places, which is, you know, great. Um, but by the same token, still in very early stages of understanding what good looks like in this environment, you know, what is it that people need exactly and getting that vibe of the thing <laughs> to understand that. So autonomy is good, but it can also be enough rope to hang yourself um, with. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Use it wisely. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Zoe? I'd say, do you, oh, sorry, Sarah, go. Um, I'd say from various from case to case, and depending on how hands-on the people above you want to be. Um, but the thing that's common between all cases is that they really want you and BCG to own. So we have these things called modules, which is a part of the project that you're responsible for. Um, and so there's a real push to be owning your module. And it doesn't mean, um, you know, having the answer to everything, but it's really you pushing things along. If you're stuck, you're asking for help. You're not asking if um, your project leader for directions on the next things to do, but you're saying, hey, I think we should do this X, Y, and Z. I think this one's the best. Which one should I go with? Appreciate your gut, your steer, your guidance. Um, of course, you know, I guess it's not the same autonomy as like your PhD where you get to choose what you want to, you know, do, you know, the, the case, I guess like sometimes the case that you get put on, you don't have full autonomy over that. So the supply chain case, for example, um, that was something brand new for me, probably wouldn't have picked it for myself, um, but it was a learning experience. Uh, but then as you get higher up and you get in different areas, you do get more say in um, what areas you want to focus on as well. And then, um, yeah, I think it's, it's a good balance of independence and um, guidance for me at the moment, which is good. Um, yeah, it's definitely not like send a, you're always constantly reporting to people. It, the, I guess I said it's the worst, as I said before, the worst thing you could do is just go off on your own for a week and then come back and surface. And yeah. so it's always like, yeah, constant guidance for the whole team. But when, the, when, when a junior member of the team sort of sends me an email like that, like, you know, this is what I've done. Um, I think this is the direction we should go in next, or I'm stuck with this, so this is what I think we should do. To me, when I'm sort of internally thinking about this person and their place in my team, that's like a huge gold star. It's not that they don't, that they have all the answers or that they did the thing perfectly that time. 
is that they're seeing themselves as part of this broader project. Um, and they're putting in their two cents worth about where, where to next. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're right. And I'm like, yes, do that. Sometimes it's like, no, <laughs> not good idea though. Um, but the fact that they're sitting there and thinking, how do I contribute to this? And how do I put my stamp on this and, and push it forward? It's actually a really big developmental leap in my view. That's kind of like a big step uh, forward for these um, consultants or, or analysts and things like that. And to me, that's always a thrill to see that. When I see that happening, I'm like, <laughs> so it's awesome. Yeah, Belinda's just put in the chat, I had a boss who would say, don't come to me with a problem, come to me with some ideas for solution. So, way to go. Um, we've talked a lot about soft skills and there's a question here about do you have books or blog recommendations about communication or leadership or management that you found helpful or I was going to say ways you can practice developing those skills, suggestions, tips. Oh, so, oh, oh that's so wow. I love it. Yeah, yeah, just like my so well. <laughs> so good. This is actually so what strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I actually, you know, I'm raised in academic English, right? That's my native language. <laughs> Give me four syllable words and I'm good. That doesn't work so great in consulting. And because I tend to think at a, a more technical pace than my peers, it can sometimes get in the way of communicating with them. So I found this book quite helpful. I actually haven't finished reading it yet, but it is helpful <laughs> um, just in terms of helping me break down how I might communicate something. Mm. Uh, and then I'll go off on my own way, but I found that quite good. There's another one that you've probably been forced to read, um, Sarah, um, Minto, Barbara Minto. I've heard of a Pyramid Principle. Pyramid Principle, yeah. <laughs> I found that a little bit, eh, um, and I struggled with that. But I quite like the fact that this book was a, a super quick read. It's got some clear infographics and I'm like, purpose of this meeting, great, I can do that. Um, so that was quite a helpful step forward for me in terms of corporate communication. Um, uh, I've got some books people. actually as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so because we don't really learn this stuff in academia, right? As no, there isn't a curriculum. It's something thing that we do. <laughs> um, so we kind of assume that it comes. It's a graduate attribute that students leave us with, but it's kind yeah, of implicit. What we give them is academic and research communication skills. Yeah. which is not necessarily the same thing as corporate communication thing. skills. Yeah. But if you think about it, anyone that's coming out of university is by, by definition, someone that can learn stuff. So all we've got to do really is just give them something structured that they could learn off. And I find that most people do quite well from that, but telling them it's the vibe of the thing, it just, it's not quite right. Yeah. is yeah. just really unhelpful. <laughs> My my books are, uh, I've got two, one's more technical, one's more like soft skills. Um, this one's, a, I didn't realise when I ordered it, it was a tiny book. I thought it was a full size book, but it's literally a tiny book. Oh, it's very little. Um, it's called How to Win, I think it's pretty like old, but it's called How to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, yeah, that's awesome. It's just like very quick tips on the like, how to just be good conversationalists, for example, and so, like very sort of like basic soft skills um, that can be helpful. And this one's more technical, that's quite easy, easy to read. It's called The Art of Statistics. And I find it's like, it's probably aimed for like a first year student in stats, like nothing super difficult, but it's just a really good book on like how to think about coming to a problem and like articulating and how you describe um, what you've done and the visualizations and like it's a good refresher. So I, like, I found it's a really good book to like think about how you're communicating your findings and like, I guess like the so what of what you're doing. Um, and I guess for like other soft skills, um, for example, a lot of my work is slide writing. And I think um, when you say like a really good presentation or like, a, um, yeah, slides, it's like, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. Like if you see a good slide, you save that and like you <laughs> reuse it, right? <laughs> um, so like learning of other people and like how they present and how they even write their emails or like how they talk to clients. Like that's how you learn and you kind of mimic and you get better through that. Um, that's one thing it took me a little while to like realize like oh I can just you know see what other people are doing and just really mimic yeah. that really quickly yeah I yeah. think the important thing with communicating with stakeholders is the best thing you can have is genuineness 
Like mm. sometimes, particularly in consulting, people get the idea that it's, it's all about the sell and I've got to be schmoozing the client and things like that. But when you're genuine and you, know, you are genuinely interested in your stakeholder's problem and you genuinely want to help them, that comes through, right? And just because someone's not the perfect communicator, but they're genuine, that's often goes, gets you sort of like three quarters of the way there. <laughs> um, Communication is important, but genuineness, I think that really builds your social capital in the organization that says, you know, Steph sometimes gets a bit lost in the technical. We're going to have to pull her out of her subspaces stuff. But she's, you know, really going to make sure this gets done or she actually really wants to know what the problem is. She's not going to try and shoehorn us into something. Or, yeah. you know, on the client side, she's not going to try and sell us stuff that we don't need. Right? Because you've got one chance <laughs> with anybody on that one. Um, yeah. yeah. Once you yeah. lose the trust, that's it. Yeah, I really echo that, like, like prompted me to think about it. just, like, the genuineness and, like, having an actual, like, the client, like, and my team, we often work, like, side by side client data scientists as well. And they are people and, you know, you talk to them about real life things. Um, and you know, when you bond over that, that's so helpful and gain that trust. And, like, I think sometimes you're not sure if they like you or not, you know, is it too transactional? Are you being too, like, formal? Uh, but, like, one thing that really, like, solidified to me how important it was, like, um, about a month ago, my dad passed away and I had to get rolled off a case. Um, but I had two of the client data scientists reach out to me separately afterwards saying, are you okay? Hope you're all right. Like, and you knew that that connection had been made because if it wasn't, they wouldn't have even reached out. And one of them I hadn't even worked with that much because it's on the case. Um, and she was really, really nice. And she reached out to me, even though I spoke to her a couple of times, but um, making sure that you have that bond and they can like, you can yeah. when you when things happen with life that people can actually like you come together and so making sure that everything's not too transactional yeah and just bring oh, everyone's yeah. people yeah. yeah yeah absolutely i think that's you know and for the client to do that after a short period sarah like that's that's a huge deal yeah that you've made that yeah. connection with the client not with and they know they know that it's not some transactional sarah's trying to sell us stuff Sarah's a human who went out of her way to help us. Sarah's part of our team. And that is, you know, that's, that's the, that's what you want. That's okay. amazing. That's really great. Um, um, right. We, oh, go to Zoe. Sorry. Hi. No, I was just going to say, um, one thing I've noticed leaving academia and the think tank world and public policy research and going into startups is, you know, there isn't that element of competitiveness that you tend to find, it might not be deliberate competitiveness in academic departments, but there's that kind of undercurrent of competition. Mm -hmm. um, and I find um, that just, it's just not apparent in my current workplace. Um, genuinely, people are nice and they're not out to get you. They're not out to get, I don't know, whatever people in the academic world might be seeking by trying to compete for more funding or whatever. Like there's no sense of competition um, in industry, really. At least I haven't noticed, I haven't noticed much of that. Um, I've only been in industry for like a month, so. so. That's a really good sign of a good culture. That yeah. idea that we're all in this, you know, all, all boats get risen by the tide or whatever it is. You know, that it's not, you know, if I can prove that I'm smarter than the next person, yeah. um, we have to do it together to be successful. You know, I cannot run an econometrics practice all by myself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I need people um, and I need stakeholders and the rest of the team to work with me and, and give me ideas and stuff. So if we're all working together and that it's not, you know, a dog eat dog atmosphere, that's an awesome sign of culture. Um, and I think that that's usually well reflected among the junior staff. If you, you know, again, with your network, if you can reach out to someone's place, how do they feel, you know? Do they feel like it's this constant case of having to prove themselves or do they feel like it's a space where actually everybody here is trying to help me and I'm trying to help them too? Because that's where you want to spend time. 
Totally. Yeah. How was your experience with competition in industry versus academia now? Um, yeah, I really am surprised by how lovely and kind industry is. Um, so the culture is to avoid burnout. So the culture where I'm working is don't get burnt out. Whereas in academia, it was um, publish or perish. You know, if you're working on the weekends, if you're working in the evenings, if you have a relationship breakdown, it doesn't really matter because yeah, you want to win a grant. Um, in my current workplace, they value being kind. They value being helpful and generous. It's part of their strategy and mission statement. Uh, also, we get rewarded by writing um, gems for it. You know, like you put online how someone's helped you and um, it still surprises me, but I love it. Um, we also have 360 feedback. So there was someone who had a bit of a strong personality, but as part of his leadership, he was asked by the people under him to give for, for us to give him feedback, which would not have happened in academia. There's um, in industry, I'm observing that. Um, so people, kindness and generosity is encouraged. And if people have got um, leadership styles that need a bit of work, they get that feedback whereas in in academia yeah i'm being <laughs> being um you know this is being recorded um whereas in academia um a couple of times uh so because of you know grants and publish and perish narcissism and bullying actually are encouraged and facilitated whereas in the place i'm working now that is squashed right out and kindness is encouraged so it's just like a totally thrilling wonderful i love it I would say it's very similar in consulting as well. Like, even though everyone around you, like, you feel like, because everyone around you is brilliant. Like, some of the associates who join, I feel so inferior to because they've done so many extracurriculars, by, you know, they're 21 and they're amazing. Um, and you get very intimidated. Um, and you feel like sometimes when you first start, you kind of feel like you have to know all the answers sometimes and be the best. And you want to try and solve everything yourself. Um, but I found that the actual the culture is actually really good. Everyone wants to help you. And they want to hold exceed as a team. And as a good like I think and um, I think that's one thing is you have to be able to be willing to ask for help to get that environment to help you back as well is one thing I realized. Everyone wants to help, but if you don't ask for it and you try and do it yourself, um, just gonna dig yourself into a hole. Like the other day I was by, like banging my head against the computer for about a day trying to solve something. I'm like, you know what, why not put my pride down and ask for help from my team very quickly. And I realized that in that quick, we had a quick conversation and it was like, to, like something totally different causing my issue that I wouldn't have found out if I didn't ask for help. And everyone really wants to give you that help and see you succeed. Um, but yeah, I think in consulting, you have to be more, like you definitely have to make sure you ask for that help and like yeah. put it's your pride really down. confidence in yourself that my value isn't contingent on my ability to do it all by myself. My yeah. value <laughs> The organization is about how I can work with my team to achieve this. And so for me, when I'm sort of watching the chat go here in our COVID environment and I see the team, you know, reaching out to each other going, Oh, I'm, I'm struggling with this. Can you jump on a call with me? That's again, that's that gold star moment, right? Cause you know that they're working together and they don't need me to mum them <laughs> into doing it. They don't your room to do this. They're just seeing themselves as a cohesive team and here's our, here's our problem and I'm going to reach out and solve it. So again, that's a big gold star moment when I see things like that happening. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Ladies, this has been totally amazing. And I, if it wasn't 903, I think we could speak, keep talking for hours and hours and hours. It's been super, super insightful. And thank you so much for your generosity in sharing your experiences and insights. And it's been really inspiring. Like there have been a couple of moments in COVID times with university crap going down where I thought, you know what, I, I could just throw it all in and be a data scientist. And you have inspired that maybe I could just throw it all in and be a data scientist. It might be a kinder place and a more generous place and maybe a happier place. I don't know. We'll see. Um, thank you to everybody who came and um, yeah, please join me in giving these ladies a massive round of applause. It's awesome. You've been a great host, Jenny. Thanks, Jenny. Awesome. Thank you. No, welcome. <laughs> welcome. Um, I hope to see you all at the end of the month for Lubra Date.
Um, and yeah, jump in for show and tell. It's super fun. Um, and if you have any ideas for things we should run, um, not necessarily related to code, we could run things about soft skills or other things, um, totally email me and, and let me know what we can do to help you all um, be, become amazing data scientists like the ladies we've been talking with today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Jenny.